Well, good morning. We have really enjoyed the last 48 hours of, of being here in Temecula. First time I've ever been here. I was born up in Pasadena, uh, but was kidnapped when I was about three and taken to Colorado by my parents. So um, lived basically in Colorado most of my life, and that's where we still have a home. Uh, we have a home base in Colorado Springs, Colorado, if some of you I'm sure have probably visited there. Um, so when we go out in our an interim in churches, we always return back there to Colorado Springs for at least a period of time. Um, and so we're, but we've really enjoyed the last couple of days here. And by the way, to the elders and the staff, they have invested a lot of their hours over these last couple of days just to interact with us. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, it's been a really good time to engage with them, to learn about the church, and just to laugh and have some good time together. So, uh, Lucy and I have, by the way, let me just introduce you. Lucy, I want you to stand for a moment just so you can put a name and a face together. Lucy's right over here, my, my better half, so. Yeah. Couldn't, do, couldn't do this without her. I couldn't do this without her. Um, been a pastor after graduating from Dallas Seminary um, since 1980 and uh, enjoyed a number of wonderful uh, pastoral experiences. And then about six years ago, God changed the trajectory of our ministry from that of being a permanent senior pastor in churches to being an interim. Uh, and like Brad said just a moment ago, uh, we come alongside churches and you, know, you never know how long it's gonna be, but typically it can be a year, 18 months, some situations it goes as long as two years. Um, to help the church prepare for a new season of Christ-honoring ministry. And if this is what the Lord has for us to come and link arms with you all, uh, that could be really an exciting thing. And literally, uh, that interim season that we would be about with you would be, could be some of the most exciting times in the life of this church. And so... We'll see what God has, but be praying, would you please? Be, be praying and asking God, what do you want? And that's what we're praying to, that God will just reveal that. So, well, I hope you have your Bibles. If you don't, grab the, the Pew Bible in front of you. But before we jump into God's Word together, let me just pray one more time um, before we nose around in what God has for us this morning. So will you join me in prayer, please? Father, we're here together, but we acknowledge that we are sitting here before you. We're not here by accident, even though maybe some of us this morning, there are maybe skid marks from our heels because we really didn't want to come. Or maybe we're here because it's more of a habit. Or maybe we're here because we couldn't wait to get up this morning and be here. But you know, and regardless of where we're coming from, you've brought us here. And there is something powerful that you want to see occur between us and you. As a father, this morning we come and we want to yield. We want our minds not only to think deeply, but we want you to have access to that deep part of our hearts where you go and like to tinker around to change us to be more like Christ. We don't know what that means right yet, but Father, would you please come? By the power of your Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit this time to you as we open up your word. Lord, my words are not going to cut it. <laughs> Boy, I know that. But Father, your word can. And that's why we're going to take this time now to explore in it. So come. Come meet each one of us right where we need you to meet us. In Jesus' name, amen. King Daka, one of the highest and fastest roller coasters in the world. One of the most intimidating, too, because it takes riders in open cars from 0 to 128 miles an hour in 3.5 seconds. Launches them up a 456-foot tower, which is about 45 stories. And then, pausing briefly at the top, there is a vertical descent where the riders are spun 270 degrees in a spin, coming out of the bottom into an extended airtime heel that leaves you in zero gravity for a number of seconds. 
Now, I don't know whether or not you would consider a ride on King Dakka an enjoyable experience, or whether some of you would say that would be one of the most foolhardy things you, I could ever do with my life. But don't miss the powerful analogy. For the type of Christianity, unfortunately, that is seen around America these days is a watered-down domestic version of the original. I mean, even a quick read of the book of Acts, the, the first generation of the followers of Jesus Christ revealed that there was nothing tame, there was nothing safe about being a follower of Jesus Christ. And more often than not, at critical junctures, it was a white-knuckle ride for them. Hunter Thompson, when he was alive, was never ever accused of ever having a biblical worldview. But he said something really on target when he made the following observation. He said, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, rather skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. So how is your journey going this morning? How is the story that Jesus Christ is calling you in fo to follow him about? Does it have its King Dakka moments? White knuckle type moments? Or is your journey in following him more of the quiet, placid, it's a small world after all at Disneyland? <laughs> told you to grab your Bibles, please do. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, because what we're going to see this morning is that the picture of life as a journey going down a road is a repeated image all throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. We'll see some of them this morning. And that journey at times is going to require us to hold on tight. It's going to require us to have a white-knuckle experience because of where Jesus is led. Not because of foolhardy decisions, but because Jesus takes us someplace that we probably would rather not go. And the quality of our life journey is going to be determined by the choices we make. We are going to come to crossroads. We're going to come to intersections. We're going to come to places where paths diverge and come back together again, and we're going to have to make decisions. Robert Frost, probably back in high school, in one of your English classes, you remember his classic line? Two roads, yes, diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. You know that Jesus Christ agrees with that? Jesus himself said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The imagery of a journey, the imagery of going down the road, is powerfully shown to us in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Uh, if you're not used to nosing around in a Bible, it's page 1206. That's my Bible. Probably doesn't help you at all. <laughs> but use the table of contents. Get there. Jeremiah 6.16 is going to be something we're going to need to look at this morning. Now, when I talk about coming to junctures, intersections where we make decisions, you need to understand, decisions then determine direction. And we need to be careful about those decisions we make. Now, I'm not talking about the kinds of decisions of what you chose to wear this morning to church. Now, I'm not talking about what you're going to choose to eat after services today at lunch. I'm not talking about which video as a family you're going to get, whether you're going to get The Secret Life of Pets or Zootopia. You know, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about what guides our choices at critical crossroad moments that determine the direction of our lives. So look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. How does it begin? ESV, that's the version I'm using this morning, says, Thus says the Lord. 
Okay, these words from God coming through his prophet were directed to an aud the original audience here anyway, living in a, in a rampant moral decline. I mean, there was social anarchy almost going on and flagrant greed at this very point in time. And it left those in Jerusalem very afraid, very uncertain, very puzzled. But those who would listen to God's words. Verse 16 gives us four imperatives, four commands, which provide kind of a divine paradigm for how do we make sure that when we come to the crossroads of life, at times in our lives, we can choose the life worth having, like Jesus said, is possible. So let's look at each one of these. Let's, let's look at these four imperatives together. Notice first, Six, verse 16 says, For thus says the Lord, stand by the roads. Literally, that it should be crossroads. The prophet Jeremiah is talking about paths that are coming across one another, and you're going to have to make a decision about which way to go. He says, stand. The first imperative is it starts by slowing down. The word stand is not asking us to get vertical. It's asking us to get tranquil. The first step in, in, in making decisions at times of crossroads to have this life worth living means we first of all have got to slow down. We've got to bring our, ourselves to a point of being still. We've got to hit the brakes. We've got to bring it to a stop. Why? Because most of us live at too fast of a pace, too hectic of a pace. And most of us, our life seems to go by us as a blur. So we come to critical decision points or, or critical crossroads and, it, and, and they just seem to fly right by us and our response was, what was that? We need to stand. We need to slow down. Because our energy levels are every day tend, seeming to be ramped up to about 6,000 RPM. Our, our work emails are coming to us on our cell phones 24-7. Twitter and Facebook alerts are clamoring for our attention. We come home and our kids want to engage with us. Our wife wants a part of our heart. Our, our professors at school believe that their syllabus requirements should be the top priority over every other professor's. And life is so intensely busy, sometimes it can feel like we're juggling chainsaws. Okay? By the way, a couple of years ago, Tim Kreider wrote an article for the New York Times called The Busy Trap. And the minute it went out, it went viral and had over a million hits. Maybe you saw it. Let me just quote a little bit from it. He's talking about busyness. And he says, if you live in America in the 21st century, you've probably had to listen to a lot of people tell you how busy they are. It's become the default response when you ask anyone, well, how you doing? The response is busy, so busy, crazy busy. And it's pretty obviously a boast described as a complaint. He goes on to say, busyness serves as a kind of hedge against emptiness. Listen carefully to him. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are busy. Completely booked, demanded every hour of the day. And he ends with this. We're busy because our own ambition or drive or anxiety because we're addicted to busyness and dread what we might have to face in its absence. Stand at the crossroads. Choosing a life worth living begins, first of all, by slowing down. Now, don't misunderstand me. We can't live standing still. That's not what I'm saying here. That's not what the text is telling us. But when we come to crossroads in our journey, when a decision determines direction, it's imperative, the text says, that we begin by coming to a halt. Our need is to slow down on the outside so something can slow down on the inside. So let me give you a, a suggestion. Some of you who are at crossroads this morning need to schedule a personal retreat. You need to get away. You need to unplug. You need to get out in nature and take nothing but your Bible and a notebook or journal. You need to unplug from your cell phone, from your tablets, from the demand of 
people who say they need you or they want you or the, the, the to-do list that you've, that you've created. Some of you need to be reintroduced to the tactile feel of a pen on paper. Now, some of you younger folks, I understand you have gone totally digital. Fine, then hit the airplane button. <laughs> but let me give you a warning. Getting away to slow down will be a very difficult thing for most all of you to do. Me too. It's not getting there. It's once you're there. Because our mind will start racing about all the things that we should be doing, all the people that we need to contact, all the next steps that we ought to be taking, all the urgent matters that need you, and the quietness will be very unnerving. So you've got to keep asking the Lord, slow me down. Slow me down. It may mean opening up your Bible and just slowly and repeatedly reading Psalm 23, Psalm 46. Lord, slow me down. Now look at Isaiah 6.16. Remember, there's four. It begins by slowing down. And then it's next is stand by the crossroads and what's the next word? Look. Take time to look around. Now, just because we have eyes doesn't mean we see. I mean, Jesus often challenged the crowds of his day around him, even his own men, that they had eyes, but they were not really seeing. So the word look here is really not talking about physical sight as much as it's talking about the, the, the ability to have perception or discernment or becoming aware or to consider something carefully or to be inspect something or to, again, discernment is really what that word's talking about. And by the way, did you notice how the first imperative then helps us do the second? Stand, and then look around. It takes standing still in order to become thoughtfully aware of the crossroad that's in front of us. So to stand at the crossroad and really look is to consider carefully the nature of the decision that we're looking at. Crossroads demand that... that a choice be made, but do I really understand what's happening around me? Have I slowed down enough to really understand what's going on out here around me? So to look is to be discerning of the, of the options, is to consider that with every option there are going to be consequences. What's going on around me? But to look is also to understand carefully what's happening in me. Because the crossroads is not just what's around out here. I'm also responding on the inside to that crossroads in some way. So what, what influences are exerting pressure uh, on each decision that's possibly in front of me? Because there may be more than one. There may be several possible options in front of you. So what are the pressures behind each one? See, for some of you here this morning, the crossroads that you're facing, extended families putting, exerting a lot of pressure on you. It could be your finances are exerting a lot of pressure on you. Could it also be that you've got an aversion to risk or an aversion to pain, and that's putting a lot of pressure on you at this crossroads? See, when I slow down and take time to look around, notice how these things begin to build together? It then allows me to do the third. So stand by the crossroads and look. Here's the third imperative, and ask. So if I slow down, look around, the third thing is I ask the profound. And notice the text says ask two specific profound questions. First, ask for the ancient paths. The first thing we've got to ask is, God, what have you designed? Now, when you read the, that phrase, ancient paths, be really careful how you interpret that. It's not talking about old man-made traditions. That's not what he's talking about. Rather, he's talking about those pathways, those trails that are eternal, that are perpetual, that will never, ever change. In other words, there are divinely designed pathways or trails to follow that have been there from the distant past and will be there all the way to the, to the far distant future. They never, ever change. They're the pathways of God. They're the trails of God. It's where he walks. It tells us what he's up to. It shows us how life works. 
I mentioned we live in Colorado, and Lucy and I enjoy hiking when we have a chance to, uh, and boy, the mountains of Colorado are a joy to explore. But you know what, if you've never been in an area before and you're gonna go there to hike, it's pretty a wise thing to get a map <laughs> to find the trails. Because the trails are there, not by accident. They've been purposely put there because that is the safe way to enter into that wilderness area to get through it and to come back out. And it's when people don't follow the trails is when a rescue has got to happen. Do you know that King David asked for God's map? Hold your finger here in Jeremiah 6. We'll be back. Turn back, if you would, into the Psalms to Psalm 25. I made a comment earlier that this imagery of life as a journey, life as a pathway that we're following is all throughout Scripture. Here's one of the great ones. Psalm 25. Let me just point out a couple of verses here. Uh, start at verse 4. David says, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. See, David is saying, God, give me the map you've got. Show me these ancient paths that never change. I've got to have them. Drop down, if you would, to verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Verse 9, he leads the humble as what is right and teaches the humble his way. See, we're talking about God's trails, God's pathways. David says, Lord, I, I need a map here. And God has given us in his word the truth of his paths, his trails absolutes which mark for us the path for our journey. Now, these absolutes do not change from generation to generation. They're not determined by Supreme Court rulings, opinion polls, or a certain political party's agenda. No. Not God's trails. Not at all. So ask the question, and the first question is, what have you designed? But then ask the second question. Again, back to, to Jeremiah 6. Hope you kept your finger there. So not only ask for the ancient paths, but ask where the good way is. There's the, se <coughs> Excuse me, there's the second profound question. Not only, God, what have you designed, but God, how does that then direct me at my crossroads? See, we think we know what the good way is. Or at least we think we do. Because um, we typically often define good by what's most profitable for me, what is most pain-free for me, what will give me that coveted promotion, what is most prudent, what will keep me most protected. And so we can say, oh yeah, I know the way. I know the trail. I know the good way. And yet sometimes we blow by the warning in Proverbs 14, 12 that says there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So, so what is the good God is doing in this generation? Well, the Bible describes the trails he's walking and the invitation that he's given to us to join him going down those paths. He's building his church. He's expanding his kingdom against the darkness. He's seeking to have the good news of this life-changing power of Jesus Christ penetrate every single heart and every single culture all around the globe. Those are the paths of God. And those are the paths of God that then come and impact my choices at my crossroads about where I go to. So ask that second question boldly, courageously to God and say, Lord, so how does this decision at my crossroads allow me to be a part of what you are doing right here, right now in this generation? Folks, that's the powerful white knuckle kind of questions to ask. Okay, so have you hung in there with me so far? Mm -hmm. You're getting a little quiet on me. That always makes me nervous. <laughs> okay, so where have we gone so far? Are we going to slow down? Yep. Are we going to look around? Are we going to ask the profound? And then, folks, what happens next is where it gets really exciting. Because this is now where the white knuckle moments begin to arise. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Jeremiah chapter 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. So if we have the guts, the spiritual guts to ask those profound questions, God, what have you designed? And then how has what you designed impact my decisions at this crossroads? God will answer. He promises it. 
Call on me and I'll answer you. I'll, I'll, I'll whisper in your ear how you turn to the right or the left when you come to, in the way. So here's number four. Look at the text again. Stand by the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and what's the next word? Walk in it. Walk what we've found. Okay, here's the critical point. Here's the critical point. Many who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ have no problem with the first three imperatives. Why? Because it's all mental gymnastics. But the fourth one is when it's time to get into the open car, sit down, strap in, and hang on. Because to walk is to live out what we've been told. See, walking, again, indicates our direction. And our choices, you all know, even the hidden ones that nobody else knows we've made, do reveal themselves in our lifestyle. It does reveal itself in our walk. And walking is a synonym of that dirty, horrible O word, obedience. Now, if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. Crossroads always bring us to a point and choice of obedience. Always. Count on it. Take that one to the bank. Our crossroads will always be a place where we have to make a decision of faith that will then be visibly obvious in our behavior. Always. Always. So I look at a passage like this, and I'm sitting in Chick-fil-A, and I don't like it. Not Chick-fil-A, the passage. <laughs> because it makes me ask, Rick, am I committed to following the Lord's lead? I don't know about you, but God has regularly in my life brought me back to what David's commitment was in Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Lord and I will walk in your truth. Is that my commitment? Is that your commitment this morning? See, many of you are this morning, I know, are at crossroads in your lives right now, this morning, somewhere. I don't know maybe what it is. I could probably guess, but you know. So like me, are, are you committed to whatever the Lord asks of you, even if it'll take you into white-knuckle situations? I don't know what it is about the character of our God. He doesn't have a problem asking us to sit in, buckle in, hang on. Peter, get out of the boat. Walk to me on the water. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Levi, walk away from your lucrative tax business. Follow me. Moses, it's time for you to go back to Egypt. And yes, I know, Moses, that that's a place where shame and failure you're going to have to face again. Esther, go stand before the king and plead for my people. Abraham, I don't want you to have lesser loves. Sacrifice your son. Noah, I know you don't know what rain is. Build an ark. <laughs> Disciples, I want you to feed 5,000 people. By the way, you only got you know, five loaves, a couple of fish. Do you think any of them were not hanging on for dear life, going, you've got to be kidding, Lord? Some of the crossroads we face, we desperately wish we didn't have to be there. We wish we could have avoided them. Lord, was there no other way? Did I really have to come to this juncture? Some of them have been very inconvenient for, for you, haven't they? They've been painful. They've been disturbing. Why? Because crossroads tend to shake our faith. It rattles our comfortable category. Sometimes it will confront our prejudices. <coughs> and to walk in it, Jeremiah 6.16, demands an expression of white-knuckle faith that we may never, ever have given before. And we're being asked to trust at a whole new level the heart of our God and his leading in our lives. 
Now back to the text. What will be the outcome of slowing down, looking around, asking the profound, and walking what we found? What's the next phrase? And find rest for your souls. Now notice something. He is not promising everything is going to work out fine as you follow him in this crossroads and where he leads you. What he's promising is the more powerful rest in here. Everything out here may seem to be coming apart. What's happening inside? At the soul, at the heart level, we can be at rest. And you know what I find fascinating? Is that this is what Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter 11. Starting in verse 28, Come to me, all you who, are labor, or who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart. And here's the quote from Jeremiah 6.16, And you will find rest for your souls. Direct quote from it. So this Old Testament gem buried here in Jeremiah chapter 6 finds wonderful fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ because he and he alone is the one who can help us slow down, look around, ask the profound, and walk what we found because he is there at the crossroads with us. We're not alone. He's there. An older spiritual saint told a friend who was at a crossroad and weighing a direction determining, determining kind of decision. He kind of counseled him and said, if you are uncertain of which of the two paths to take, choose the one on which the shadow of the cross falls. Slow down. Look around. Ask the profound. Walk what you found. As Jesus leads me, you, in white knuckle situations for his name's sake. Let's pray. And before we pray, I'm going to do something that I don't I have no idea whether it's done here or not. I guess it doesn't matter. We're going to do it anyway. Some of you are at major crossroads right now, and I want the privilege to pray over you. It may be something about the last five months in this church. It may be something that nobody else knows, not even your spouse or your mom or dad. But you are at a decision point because the crossroads are there. If that's where you are this morning and you would like a special prayer, I would like to have you stand right now. I don't care what people around you think. I want you to stand right now because I want to pray over you because of the crossroads you're at. Go ahead, just stand. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you that in our weakness you are strong. I want to thank you that there isn't anything we can tell you this morning that you don't already know. For my brothers and sisters that are standing here, and even for those that are seated, the crossroads of life, you know, are challenging for us in so many different levels. And I just want to pray over those that have had the courage to stand right here this morning, that you would come and meet them at your, their crossroads, that they would know beyond a certain that you are there, that they're not alone that you can provide the wisdom and the insight that they need, that you can slow their lives down so they can really be discerning by your Holy Spirit's power. That, Father, you can give answers as they plead and cry out to you, Lord, what do I do? Father, that you will give them the way that they can walk obediently in following you. Lord, give them courage to not care what other people think but that your purposes and your applause is what's most important. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have led so graciously in my crossroads. And so I pray for my dear brothers and sisters right here, right now, 
encourage them, strengthen them, give them that firm hope that you will answer and you will lead. And some of them maybe have been waiting on you for a long time at that crossroads. Show up today. Give them that conviction, the promises from your word that they can hang on to day by day and then follow you obediently as you lead. Father, for all of us, it may not be a crossroads we're at today, but it may show up tomorrow. Unexpected, unplanned for. But thank you that we have the confidence that you will be there to greet us as we come. And that we can hold on to Jeremiah 6.16, even if it means a white-knuckle experience. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement, the challenge of it. Thank you for what you're now going to do in our lives as we now go live this out Monday to Saturday, where it really matters. Father, may you get the glory from it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Thank you.